Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about this story. Some of you already know it. Uh, and uh, I put a subtitle under it. This, and one thing I learned from this experience of the last five years is that it's much easier to publish something that is expected than publish something that is not expected. And this is the story of something we found in Maso that was uh, at the beginning unexpected. And as many of you know, I've worked for several years in the laboratory of Clara Armstrong in Philadelphia. At the time also, Lee Sweeney was there. And uh, working with Clara, we were interested in studying uh, excitation contraction coupling, both in skeletal and cardiac muscle. And studying EC coupling, obviously, uh, I became a fan of the sarcotubular system. So I was working on sarcotubular system uh, back uh, in those years, and I'm still doing that. And uh, the sarcotubular system is a complex uh, system of membranes that is wrapped around the myofibrils and is composed of intracellular membranes, the one you see in blue, which accumulates calcium, which is needed to activate muscle contraction, and uh, transfer tubules, which here are in yellow, which are invagination of the surface membrane, which carries the action potential into the fiber to activate calcium release. But when we talk about calcium homeostasis in muscle, it's a kind of a complex uh, mechanism that is not just EC coupling. Yes, EC coupling is important to activate muscle contraction. And when, uh, when there is depolarization of the transverse tubule, we have calcium release from Ryanodine receptors, which is activated by voltage sensors in the transverse tubule. But then uh, we have uh, to muscle to relax, uh, calcium is removed by cerca pumps and goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then there is a small amount of calcium. We know it goes into the mitochondria to the mitochondria calcium reporter. And we have heard also about from Paul about the permeability transition pore. And the uh, entry to the MCU is probably important to activate uh, aerobic ATP production. But when muscle is continually stimulated, what happens is that some calcium is also extruded from the cells in the extracellular space. And when we stimulate the muscle for a long time, probably uh, what happens is that the sarcoplasmic reticulum undergoes an SR depletion. So the level of calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a little lower. And this is a mechanism that probably contributes to muscle fatigue. When SR depletion is um, a little uh, higher, what happens is that muscle has some mechanism to um, retake, uh, reuptake calcium from the extracellular space. And one of these mechanisms is known as store operated calcium entry. Um, so it's a calcium entry mechanism and is mediated by these two proteins that I'm going to introduce in the next slide. These two proteins have been discovered only about 15 years ago, and are STIM1, which is a protein uh, located in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and of sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle, and which is a calcium sensor that can uh, read the amount of calcium in the, uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the other protein is ORI1. ORI1 is a crack channel, which is uh, usually closed, but then activates when uh, is that ORI1 opens when it's activated by oligo, um, by STEM1 that becomes a, a mixed oligo, oligomers of uh, two proteins when the SR uh, is, uh, or the ER is depleted. And then uh, uh, STEM1 migrates uh, uh, close to ORI1 and opens this channel and the cells can recover calcium from the extracellular space. So in muscle, uh, Soki has been, um, measured for the first time at the beginning of this century. And uh, now we know that Soki muscle uh, contributes probably to muscle dysfunction in aging and dystrophy. Then mutations in STEM1 and ORI1 are linked to tubular aggregate myopathy. And you're gonna hear about tubular aggregate myopathy actually in one of the next talks uh, by Simona Bon Compagni. And what we need, we need to remember for my talk today is that Soki limits muscle fatigue because can uh, uh, allows fibers to um, reuptake uh, calcium from the extracellular space during fatigue indeed. 
So since in muscle, um, Soki seems to be activated quite uh, fast, it, was be, it has been uh, suggested uh, the big, for um, several years that uh, Soki must occur at the same junction that mediate excitation contraction coupling, meaning the triads. And uh, this was proposed without uh, any experiment being really made. But uh, when this, uh, when people was writing in papers that uh, Soki would take place in triads, I was I was not very convinced of this. And why? I was not very convinced because working, as I told you, in the laboratory of Clara Armstrong for several years, one thing I learned is that uh, triads are a structure in which there are uh, many proteins involved in easy coupling. The main one, uh, the main one being the Ryan the receptor, which has a very large cytoplasmic domain, which is also visible in the EM. Here you see the triad in which the transverse tubule is longitudinal this way. And you see all these little densities in the junctional gap between the SR and the transverse tubules and also down here. These are Ryan the receptor and Ryan the receptor make uh, very ordered arrays and they touch each other corner by corner. And um, beside the Ryan the receptor are also several other protein involved in the, in the mechanism which that makes this junctional gap very crowded. And now people, they were telling me that uh, when uh, Soki was activated, steam has to fluctuate in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and try to recruit the right channel on the other side. This, it didn't make much sense to me. And also one thing that didn't convince me about this hypothesis was the fact that uh, usually in muscle, you know, we have several structures which are kind of specialized in one mechanism. You know, we have the sarcomere, which is, uh, um, uh, has to make, uh, is uh, devoted to make uh, shortening and contraction and to produce force. We have mitochondria, which uh, are deputed to aerobic ATP production. We have the triad, which uh, is uh, deputed to EC coupling. And my question at the time was, uh, do STEAM1 and ORI1 interact really at the triad, the same junction deputed to EC coupling during SOCI? And uh, we started uh, together with uh, Simona von Compagni and people in my lab to work on a project to try to uh, identify the sites in which uh, STEAM1 and ORI1 uh, interact in muscle. And at the beginning, we didn't have much success, but then uh, Simona, together with Antonio Michelucci in the lab, they decided to do an obvious experiment. So what they did, they, they uh, fatigued mice on a treadmill. Here you see the mice uh, still during the warm up uh, on a treadmill, but they do an incremental running protocol from 10 to 25 meters per minute. The length of the protocol was uh, uh, 45 minutes, uh, about 45 minutes. And um, the goal of the protocol was to fatigue the mice and possibly to activate uh, soke in muscle. And then uh, my, uh, the muscles were excised from these mice. And the series of experiments that you see here, uh, listed here, were performed. But the first experiment that gave immediately the most striking result was the analysis of muscle of exercised animal by electron microscopy. And now if you look at these images, what you see is that in this area of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and correspondence of the Z-line, between the triads, here you will see one triad and another triad is on the other side here. You see that in control muscle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very convoluted. You see all these vesicles, but after one hour of exercise, there was the surprising result. All of a sudden, we have uh, in many points in the fiber, these uh, stacks, uh, at the beginning, we called them stacks of sarcoplasmic reticulum membranes. I wanted to you to see them enlarged here and here, which uh, in control muscle were not present or indeed probably they were present, but just nobody has noticed them because they were small. Uh, but after exercise, they were much bigger in size. And we were very puzzled by this finding, but also excited. And we went on with the experiments. 
And the second experiments we did was to stain the fibers of exercised animals with uh, ferrocyanide. And uh, ferrocyanide is a compound that uh, uh, precipitates in the lumen of the transfer tubule from the outside and enters the fibers. And what we noticed is that, is that in exercised animals, the transfer tubule following exercise elongates from the triad toward the Z line and uh, goes between the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And also over here, you also see that we have a transfer tubule next to one of those stacks of membranes. And when we are lucky enough, what we see is that uh, here, you see a transfer tubule from the triad going toward the Z line, making the special junctions with this flat cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that now are uh, uh, labeled in yellow. So this uh, was the finding number two. So we have rearrangement of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and we have also the, the elongation of the transfer tubule toward the Z line during exercise. Then we went on to do some experiment of immunofluorescence and we stained, uh, here you see stained in red, STEM1, and in green, or I1, the two proteins that are uh, uh, involved in a store operated calcium entry. And the most obvious thing is that uh, if you look at these images uh, in control muscle, you see that the red, the red staining and the grid staining are not together. They are still separated. Like if STEM1 and or I1 are not in the same region of the sarcomere. And uh, here you see the, the uh, line of uh, fluorescence of the two fluorophores and you see the red and green don't really go well together. But then after one hour of exercise, what we have is that a lot of the green and the and um, a lot of the green and the red are now together and they give yellow color. And now if you see the traces, the two proteins seems that after exercise, the localization between STEM1 and ORI1 is much increased. And I wanted to remind you that ORI1 is a protein localized in the transfer tubule. And the most obvious interpretation of this finding is that uh, what happened is that uh, ORI1, which is located in the transfer tubule, moves with the elongation of the transfer tubule at the I band to make colocalization with STEM1, which was already localized at the I band. So we were very excited about these findings because what we are looking at, we were looking at a reorganization of the transfer tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum induced by exercise. And this reorganization would improve the colocalization of the two proteins that were involved in store operated calcium entry. And we went on to, uh, Simona actually um, uh, made this cartoon in which what we uh, modeled was the situation before exercise and after exercise. And uh, uh, the possible events leading to formation of this new junction between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the transfer tubule were the two fundamental steps. One, the elongation of the transfer tubule toward the Z line that here is modeled in, uh, in white. And then a reorganization of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into these uh, flat st stacks of cisterna that would get close to this transfer tubule. And now here, what you see, the transfer tubule has these uh, green dots, which represents ORI1. And while the little red strands are uh, STEM1, and the following exercise, this remodeling allows the, uh, the interaction, the colocalization between STEM1 and ORI1 and uh, the entry of, we thought this would be the pathway for the entry of calcium uh, from the extracellular space during SOCI. And we uh, sent the paper out for publication, but the, um, the reviewers didn't actually share our uh, uh, excitement. And the paper was rejected more than once. By the time we are also working in doing uh, functional experiments. And in the functional experiments, what we did was to um, uh, perform a fatigue protocol in muscle of uh, control mice and in muscle excised from mice that were uh, uh, 
uh, already pre-exercised. So they, they did the incremental running protocol on the treadmill. And you see that the, in presence of extracellular calcium, the, the muscle from the mice that were pre-exercised was more resistant to fatigue than the muscle of control animal. And this was very, very obvious, uh, very obvious in this in these graphs. So the decay in muscle force was uh, reduced in the animals uh, um, that had already they had the, those junctures that I showed you already pre-assembled. And then we did the experiment in zero extracellular calcium, and also in presence of two blockers of uh, store-operated calcium entry such as BTP2 and 2APB. And you see that the drop in force that we got in the control uh, muscles was lower than the drop in force that we, that we uh, add when we block the entry of calcium from the extracellular phase in the pre-exercise animals that already had those junctions that I show you pre-assembled, indicating that- Three minutes left. Thank you. And uh, showing that this muscle had uh, uh, more dependence on extracellular calcium. So we managed to publish the first paper in 2017 in Scientific Rappers. Uh, good journal, but not as good as we wanted to be. And then we went ahead in collaboration with the laboratory of uh, Bob Dix and one of our students, Antonio Michelucci, moved to the lab and they did two other experiments. First, uh, they used manganese quench to, which is the uh, gold standard technique to measure entry of di divalent cations from the extracellular space. And this experiment showed that uh, muscles, uh, actually single fibers from pre-exercised animals, they have uh, an increased entry of divalent cations. So this was a direct measure of store operated calcium entry. And then also what we did, we determined the time course of disassembly of calcium entry units. So we hypothesized that calcium entry units would assemble during exercise and would disassemble following, uh, following recovery. And actually this experiment were published recently in 2019 in a paper in eLife. And in this paper, what we showed that indeed the calcium entry unit, they assemble during exercise, they would disassemble in the following hours. Actually in less than six hours, the transfer tubule is almost completely retracted from these junctions. And the disassembly of this SR stacks takes about 24 hours. And the interesting is that uh, if you look at the time course of disassembly of transfer tubule, goes very well with the rate of manganese quench. And this indicates actually that the key event in the assembly of calcium entry units is the elongation of the transfer tubule from the triad into these new junctions that now we are called we have called calcium entry units, and we are pretty sure these are the sites of calcium entry in muscle. So to go back to the initial question that I posed at the beginning of my talk, is that uh, do STEM one and ORI one interact at the triad during SOCI? Our answer to this question is no. Actually, SOCI has uh, special junctions that are different from the triads, even if they are not so far from the triads. These structures are the sites for calcium entry, and they, uh, they are dynamic structure that assemble and, and disassemble during exercise and during recovery. And um, so we have named these junctions, as I told you, calcium entry units. And I want to close with this slide that was given to me by uh, Lars Larsson uh, that says, uh, the three stages of truth, and you can read that at first is ridiculed, then violently opposed, and then finally becomes accepted as uh, self-evident. I think that now this idea has been accepted by the people of the field because in 2020, meaning this year, a few months ago, this commentary uh, was published in the Journal General of Physiology that says excitation contraction coupling meets calcium entry units, new focus on the back door for calcium ions in skeletal muscle cells. So for a long time, we have said that uh, skeletal muscle fibers don't use uh, much of extracellular calcium. And this was because EC coupling is uh, extracellular calcium independent. But now um, a lot more groups are trying to pay attention of the role 
about the role of uh, uh, calcium entry, especially during uh, muscle fatigue. Uh, I would like to finish thanking the people of my lab and all of the founding agencies and all of you for being here um, online to follow this presentation so late at night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Feliciano. Two questions, three questions, short question, hey, short question. Can, can, can I ask answer. a short question? Okay, well, I'll let my wife ask the question. Go ahead. <laughs> I have just a brief question. It's it, it really fascinating. I wondered where the membrane is coming from with the T tubular extension. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, other people have asked to us about this. Um, first of all, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is already there. There is a lot of sarcoplasmic reticulum at the eye band, and I think uh, what's happening is just reorganizing itself. About the transverse tubule, um, I'm not sure about this. However, discussing with Clara, which is the main expert in this, um, we know that the transverse tubule, part of it is junctional. So meaning it makes junction with the, with the triad to perform easy coupling. But between one triad and another, there is some extra transverse tubule, usually, which is not junctional, which is kind of convoluted. So it is possible that the tubule to make this new junction is already there. But uh, you know we have to investigate more of this. So by Clara uh, has several papers published on this. And uh, you know, there is, uh, even in fast fibers in which the triads are longer, there is part of transfer tubule which is non-junctional for easy coupling. And maybe that's the transfer tubule that gets involved in the formation of these new junctions. Next question. Yeah, I just had a short question. Uh, have you looked at the heart at all? Uh, do these you think these structures exist in the heart? Um, not yet. Uh, so far, I've seen uh, just, uh, I think it was two years ago, a year and a half ago, when we were uh, at your meeting in Gainesville, there was uh, a poster in which somebody started to look at store operated calcium entry in uh, cardiomyocytes. And uh, one of the authors on that poster was Silvia Priori. I remember because I remember this because I collaborated with her. No, I, we haven't looked at cardiac muscle yet and I don't know much yet. So obviously it would be something. Des, to despite we are 20 minutes late, the, la, the third and last question, please. If not, we move to no, no, the next may I ask? Yes, Stefano. Uh, Feliciano, do you know if uh, there is a driving force uh, to allow the transversal tube to penetrate in that region and not uh, in another? We don't know what is pulling the transverse tube on. We have, we're starting a collaboration. In our collaboration with Robert Dirksen at the University of Rochester, um, we have sent uh, an NIH grant that uh, we have to resubmit in March, in which uh, we are proposing to start looking if there are molecular motors so they can uh, pull the transfer tubules toward, uh, toward the Z-line. Obviously, this is very interesting. I mean, to, to start studying the mechanism that allows the, the formation of this junction. Yes, definitely. We don't know anything yet at the moment. Thank you. It is 30 years that I say that morphogenesis, or internal morphogenesis of skeletal muscle, any cells, is the biggest un, unknown problem, biological problem. No one cares. All people describe the structure without a question, but who, who drive, who drive, who, who orchestrate all these uh, things? Maybe Feliciano will contribute to, 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 well, think to answer this basic question. Next speaker, maybe, sorry, Feliciano, your yes. last comment, please. No, I say we have to start looking at the interaction in between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the, and the internal cytoskeleton to, to, um, to see which are the molecular motors that drives the arrangement of membranes. Yeah.